Welcome, everyone, to the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Say a quick piece of business. My new book, Dirty Doc Ames and the Scandal That Shook Minneapolis, will be officially out on April 1st. For anyone in Minnesota especially, copies will be easy to find at your local bookstores. For everyone else, available for pre-order at barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. It's a crazy, epic story of deep political corruption, family betrayal, and a cast of characters that are bizarre, larger than life, and unbelievably colorful. Again, I'll probably do a little bonus episode on my book around the time of its release, but for those interested in getting a head start and getting their orders in, it is now possible. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your support. All right, on to the show. My guest today is Lisa Espich, the daughter of Richard Bruns, author of a book officially available this week called I, a Squealer, The Insider's Account of the Pied Piper of Tucson Murders. And it's an absolutely spellbinding read. So glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I've got lots of questions for you. So this interview is a bit different than for some of the other guests I've had on my show, in that you are representing the author of the book we're about to discuss. The author of the book is your father. And part of why this book is so compelling is that your father wrote this book because he had a very close relationship in 1965 with one of the most notorious killers in history, Charles Schmid, better known as the Pied Piper of Tucson. Yes. So as you mentioned, he was a close friend with Charles Schmid as they were teenagers. And Charles Schmid ended up confiding everything to my father. And in that process, there's a lot of things that happened. My father did not go to the police right away. And there's reasons, uh, personal reasons that he didn't, but he gets really in over his head with all of this. And he is the one that eventually goes to the police and blows the whistle on Charles Schmid, resulting in Schmid's arrest and conviction for multiple murders in Tucson, Arizona. At the time of the trials, the media attention was was huge. And so you had at that time Life magazine, which was one of the big magazines, did a whole feature on the cases, which really put it into the national spotlight. Playboy magazine featured the cases. And so pretty much the whole uh, world was seeing the story unfold. And my father was not always portrayed in the most positive light. And so he started writing his story at the time of the trials in 1967 which I think was really his way to put down his side so people understood without the media trying to sensationalize the story, how he got caught up in all of this. Of course, after it was written, you know, back in 1967, as a 20-year-old man, he didn't know what to do with this book and ended up boxing it up and moving on with his life. Forty years later, my sisters and I were going through old photos and mementos and came across the manuscript, which we did not know existed. And so I took it home and read it and was really overwhelmed by all of it. As a daughter, I I knew actually very little about the cases. We knew that my father was involved and we knew that my father was the one that went to the police, but really that's kind of all we knew. And in reading it and understanding what my father went through and how involved he was, it was just really not only overwhelming, but I felt like his side of the story should be out there because there's so much on this cases out, you know, on the internet and for people to see. And I thought his side should be shared. I went to him with the manuscript and showed him that I had it and that I had read it. I think initially he was kind of shocked that it was still around. I think he was a little thrown that I had just read it and I, he really just wanted it back and he took it back and that was the end of that. But Over the years, the case kept coming back to the surface, even though almost 50 years had passed. Local media was always bringing up the story again. And my father would see these things and get frustrated because he was always portrayed in this real exaggerated way. And they didn't always get the facts right. And I just kept saying to him, you know, you have your story for people to read as well if they're interested in this case. And you really should, you know, put that out there. And eventually I was able to convince him to do that. I had published my own book in 2010, so I I had contacts 
contacts and people to to get it into their hands. And that's how the publishing of the book started. What made this book especially compelling for me was that it was written not long after these events happened. And not only is it told from your father's perspective, but it kind of has a vintage feel, you know, that the language he uses feels like the era, which, which made it especially fun to read. Yeah, and I agree. I think what makes it special is that it is, I think if my father, and actually my father has not read the book again. So my father has not read the book since he wrote it 50 years ago. He chooses not to because he knows that if he read it today, he would feel very differently about some of the things he wrote. I mean, everybody is different when they're 20 versus 71 years old. And so I think it actually is a good thing that he doesn't want to read it because he probably would feel differently about things and want to change it. And I think that is what makes it so special is this is who he was at 20 years old, how he felt, what he went through. And if it was different and he had written the story just recently, it it would be a totally different story because it'd be from a, a 50 year you know span of time uh, from that. And, and I think it would be a different story. Yeah, absolutely. Did it need to be edited at all? Yeah, it it was really important that we didn't, as far as edit and like change, we kept the integrity of the original manuscript. So if you compare the two, there's almost no difference at all, just some grammatical errors that had to be fixed, maybe some structure of some sentences. But some of the chapters are exactly as they were in 1967. Some have a little bit of structural change, but the, the, the writing is exactly the same. And I think what impresses me for a daughter looking at her father who wrote this book is at the time that he wrote it, he had dropped out of school in the ninth grade. So he had a ninth grade education. He had only read one book in his entire life up to that point. And, you know, when you read it, he really writes very eloquently. And I don't know really how he did write that well at 20 years old with with no no real education to speak of. Now he later went back to the University of Arizona and became a teacher, but I'm that impresses me alone that he was able to write that with the education that he had and the experience he had in reading and writing. The book in being told from his standpoint, so close in time to what had happened, is very emotional and it's easy to feel what he was feeling as he put his experiences to paper. Yeah, I agree. And that's not easy to do, to put your feelings in words that way. So that's what really impressed me is, you know, it it really pulls you into exactly what he was going through. How old were you when you first learned about your dad's connection to this guy? And and what did it mean to you as you were growing up? So I think the interesting thing, you know, growing up in the 70s, I think it's very different than if I was a kid growing up today and these things happen today. Parents didn't really talk to their kids about adult topics like they do today. And we knew very little. I remember growing up and I was probably in about, I don't know, first or second grade. There was a book in our home, which was the Tucson Murders by uh, John Gilmore. It later was republished as Cold Blooded. But that book was in our home, and I remember seeing it, and it had pictures of Charles Schmid, who was this really monstrous-looking man at that point, and it had pictures of my father, and it did, under the pictures, you know, show that he was the one that turned Schmid in, Schmid in. but at that time, I was too young to really read the book, and I knew very little. My parents didn't talk about it. Other people didn't really talk to us about it. So I knew very little. My sisters knew very little. And I think it's interesting now because in publishing the book, I really had to delve into a lot of the research because at the back of the book is the appendix section with kind of an update to the reader. And so I had to do a lot of research. And I actually don't know now why my sisters and I never really looked into the cases because there's a lot of information on it. But I think we just chose not to do that. And so Actually, growing up, it wasn't a part of my life at all because we knew very little. So it was really just in this process that I've really gotten to know the cases so well. So let's go back to the beginning of your father's relationship with Charles Schmid. How how did they first meet and how did their friendship grow? My father was 15 and Charles Schmid was 18 when they first met. And my father was actually at a thrifty drugstore store. 
And he was, there was a mutual friend that they had. And my father was talking to that mutual friend who worked at the thrifty drugstore. And Charles Schmidt, everyone called him Smitty, came in and kind of joined the conversation. My father was walking home after that. And Smitty pulled up in his car and asked my dad if he wanted a ride home. My dad accepted. And really, that was the starting point of their friendship. And they really became quite close. And... um spent a lot of time together. It's obvious to me why my father would be drawn to Smitty. You know, he was three years older than my father. At that point, he hadn't kind of gone over the edge. He was just this good looking, uh, popular guy, had his own car, lived in his own cottage home on his parents' property. His parents, who were well off, gave him a $300 a month allowance, which was huge at that time, a lot of money. And so here was this guy who was always throwing parties, surrounded by a lot of people, always had girls around him, had his own car. So I can see why my dad was drawn to this friendship. I'm a little more confused what Smitty's draw to my dad was, except that I think that they just had somehow a connection and uh, they really became close friends. Interesting. Can you talk a little bit about Charles Schmid's background, kind of a brief history up to the point where he met your dad. Yes. So he was adopted, I think, right after birth to Charles and Catherine Schmid, who owned a nursing home here in Tucson Hillcrest Nursing Home. I believe that they owned a second nursing home later on. But he was you know, very close with his adopted mother. From what I've read, he did have a strained relationship with his adopted father. But as he got older, his adopted mother really doted on Charles. And I think to his detriment, she really enabled him. At one point, he dropped out of school. And I think she just really enabled him to kind of have this life of you know, doing whatever he wanted with no responsibility. But he was very close with his adopted mother, and they pretty much just gave him everything he wanted. One of the stranger aspects of the story to me, and I'm sure others, is Schmid's appearance. And there are plenty of of photos on Google, too, of him. He's really weird looking. Can you describe his appearance for us? Yeah, so he really got very bizarre. So when my father first met him, like I said, mentioned before, he was just this cool guy. He was a very good looking guy, very short, but very athletic. He was a gymnast. And in fact, he led uh, Tucson High School into a the champion state championship because he was a very strong gymnast and uh, really had a very um, appealing way about him. As he started to to go over the deep end, he started to really create this persona of himself where he dyed his hair jet black. He would dye his chest hairs, his eyebrows, everything. He really was trying to take on an Elvis Presley kind of look, but in a very distorted way. He wore pancake makeup and he painted this mole on his cheek that over time just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I think the one thing that really stands out about him that everyone's always written anything I've read about Charles Schmidt is his boots. So as I mentioned, he was a short guy. He was 5'3", which is very short, but he had practice. He had these boots that were too big for him, but he would stuff it, stuff the boots with rags and whatever he could get in there. And he practiced walking in these boots, almost like walking on stilts to the point that he was able to walk and and put on several inches of height to his small frame. And so my father remembers that he always had a very clunky walk, but nobody ever thought that he was stuffing his boots. But um, so that was one of the interesting aspects of him. But he really, like you said, if you Google images, and then we have uh, quite a few images in the book that just show how odd and bizarre he he became. He has very few pictures that you can find before that time. And one of the photographs in your book has him sitting in the police station looking pretty dejected and his boots are off and all of that garbage he had stashed in his his boots, it's spread out all over the floor, right? 
Yeah, it's really incredible because it's actually a picture that had never been released to the public before. I was able to retrieve the Tucson police photos from the Tucson Police Department. And so they've never been published. The police had him take his boots off and then they spread out everything that was inside of the boots. And it's amazing when you see how much he had shoved in those boots. Um, yeah, very interesting. So you've described Schmid, but but I'd like to ask you about your father, of course, as well. What were the circumstances of your father's upbringing and and where was he living when this all happened? So my father had really a very typical middle class family upbringing. He moved here from Ohio with his older brother, who's four years older than him, and his parents. I believe my father was around 13 or 14 when they moved out here. And, you know, very typical upbringing they had. Uh, my grandfather was a electrical engineer or an electric technician, but he made a good living. My grandmother later became a manicurist. But, there, you know, when you look at his family upbringing, there's nothing really. It's just your typical family in the 60s, very traditional. And, you know, my father definitely was maybe had a little rebellious side to him that um, and his parents I remember my grandparents were always very quiet, uh, and I think sometimes they didn't know how to handle his rebellion. But other than that, it was a very normal upbringing. There wasn't anything that really stands out in my father's upbringing that was negative or or difficult. And that friendship with Schmidt, I mean, my father was still living with his – so my father never moved in with Schmidt or anything like that. He continued to live with his parents through this this whole situation. He he would visit Schmidt a lot, though, right? Yeah, he spent a lot of time with Schmidt. My father had dropped out of high school in the ninth grade. And I think that, like Schmidt's parents, I think my grandparents didn't really hold my father accountable to do anything. And so in in reading my father's story, you really kind of get that these were two people that had dropped out of high school and had too much time on their hands and really just spent a lot of time hanging out together. And I think that's probably another reason why they had this friendship, is they both just had a lot of time and hung out a lot. I'm sure you've read the book or seen the movie The Outsiders. This story kind of has that feel to it, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's right. It's actually right at that same timeline that The Outsiders is written. And like you mentioned, I mean, there's things in the story that at the time when it was writing, it was just like he talks about running into the milkman. And, you know, you read that and you're like, you know, who runs into a milkman? But at that time, you still had milkmen and, you know, these things that it was a different it was definitely a different time. But um, but yeah, it really takes you into those that mid 60s feel. So I'd like to ask you about the first murder victim and how your father finds out about her. Can can you talk about Aileen Rowe? Schmidt picked her out kind of randomly, didn't he? Well, actually, I don't think it was as random as Schmidt had decided at some point that he wanted to kill a girl. And in fact, he had convinced another friend of his, John Saunders, to do it with him. And they actually were looking for the right victim. And at one point, Schmidt had even written a list of several names of girls that he was considering for to do this. And they had decided on Aline Rowe and actually convinced his Schmidt's girlfriend at the time, one of his steady girlfriends, Mary French, they convinced her to get Aline to come out one night. So they parked near her home. Her mother was a single mom. Uh, She had divorced parents, and her mom was a nurse and worked at night. So they waited for the mom to leave for work. And then Mary French went to Aline Rowe's window and convinced her to come out. It's clear she had no intention of going out that night because she had rollers in her hair. She was wearing a bathing suit with a, a dress over it and clearly had just gotten convinced to come out with them. They ended up driving out to the desert and um, ended up, John and Schmid ended up raping her. And according to Schmidt, he tried to strangle her first and she wouldn't strangle. And so they ended up killing her by hitting her over the head with either a rock or rocks and and killed her. 
And so I don't, I don't feel it's very random. They, they really set out to, they knew what they were going to do that night. Right, right. Only random in, in the sense that she didn't have a relationship with him and she had no idea what was coming. It was almost like he was picking her out of a hat. They just picked somebody. Yeah. Do you know what qualifications they were using to, to choose their victim? I don't. I just know that they were looking for a young girl that to kill. And so I don't know why they chose her. Maybe it's because they knew that the mom left every night and she was on her own. But I don't I, I never read or saw any details of exactly why they chose her. But it's very sad. She was a very um, from everything you read, very innocent, clean cut, good student, just a really nice young girl. And very, very sad. And and where did they take her exactly? So they took her to a place in the desert that um, anyone who knows Tucson, it's it's way out at um, Golf Links and Harrison area in Tucson, but it's way out in the desert. In fact, that area where they ended up burying her is still um, undeveloped, but it was just a big area of desert that people used to go out and hang out out, out there. I'm guessing she probably didn't blink an eye when they drove out to the desert to party. I'm guessing that that was pretty typical for kids living in Tucson. Yeah, so desert parties were a big thing here in Tucson. And, you know, again, I don't I certainly don't think she had any reason to think that she you know, it's sad when you think about it, at what point she may have known something was wrong. But clearly going out there, I don't think she I think she probably just wanted to go along with everyone and, you know, be cool. And that's, and she got, she was in the wrong place. Yeah. So when did your your father first become aware that Schmid killed Aileen? So my father, about six months after the killing, my father was just hanging out at a park with Schmid when he confessed to my father that he and John and Mary French had all done this. I think my father did believe it, but at the same time, didn't know what to believe with Schmidt. He was quite the storyteller and he was always telling crazy stories. And so I think my father did in his gut know that this really happened, but at the same time, wasn't sure that it really happened. He wasn't giving any specific details of where they buried the body or anything like that. So while Schmidt confessed it to him, I don't know that he at that point took it completely serious or knew what to do with that information. And so he did nothing with that information. But he did at that time start seeing Schmidt really evolving and changing and getting um, kind of going crazy. And this is a pattern for Schmidt, right? He, he likes to talk. He has a big, big mouth and just tells your father out of the blue what, what he did without any prompting. And he also confessed to murdering another woman who we'll talk yeah. about in a minute. Do you think it was his ego? Was it so large that he didn't think twice about revealing what he did? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think he definitely was. And they don't, you know, back in the 60s, the word psychopath really wasn't a word that was even used. But I think when you look at who Schmid was and how he evolved, he clearly was a psychopath and clearly had clearly was going crazy and, you know, didn't seem to think twice about sharing details with other people. So most of us, if we were approached by a friend and told by that friend that he'd murdered someone, I, I'm sure you would. I certainly would call the police immediately. Yeah. But but your dad didn't. Do you know why? So I and that's one of the things that really the media really raked him over the coals for. He was there was a lot of suspicion on my father when all of this came out, because that was the big question. You know, if he wasn't involved, if if he wasn't involved in these killings, why didn't he go to the police sooner? I think that in reading the my dad's side, you do get a sense of I think, first of all, he was never until until later on when he's actually taken out to the bodies, he's never really known for sure at that point that it really happened. Again, Schmid was a real storyteller and was always making up stories and everything was always 
you know, over the top. So I think part of him either didn't really believe that he did it or or wasn't sure that he did it. And I think also just not, you know, over time, my father started getting scared himself. Uh, Smitty had a lot of friends and other people had been told about these things. And I think my father started to even fear for his own life, you know, of what could happen to him if he, because he didn't have any specific details to lead the police anywhere. The police had already, with Aline Rowe, they had interviewed all of the kids, including Schmid. They had no evidence against him. So at that time, if he had gone to the police, it really would have just been him sharing that, you know, Schmid shared the story, but really no details or specifics. And so uh, I think he was also afraid of what position that put him in and, you know, if if he had to fear for his own life at that point. What did your your dad believe was Schmid's motive for murder? What was it simply for the the sheer joy of of doing it? So the Aline Rowe murder was was specifically just because he wanted he just wanted to see what it was like to kill somebody and that was the only reason behind it. Had your your father noticed any violent tendencies from Schmid up to that point? Yeah, so around the same time that all of this was unfolding and and Schmid was starting to change and evolve, uh, my father writes in the beginning of his story about a time that Schmid actually took his pet cat and by the tail swung it around and was hitting it against a wall while my dad was sitting there watching. Uh, my my dad was completely appalled. Uh, Schmid had turned to my father and asked why he felt compassion for the cat. And my dad really kind of knew at that time he he was going crazy. And my father just got out of there as fast as he could. Um, so he was, you know, that really stood out to my dad as just an extreme violent thing that he did. And then, of course, you know, he would punch walls and put holes in walls and things like that. But the the cat situation really showed how crazy he was was going. And it's a horrible story about a cat. I guess the cat did survive. I mean, you kind of in reading it, you assume the cat died. And I guess the cat did walk away and it kept hanging around. But I'm sure um, it was not ever the same after that. So it's a horrible story that gets shared. Yeah, for sure. It's it's terrible. So a big part of your father's story revolves around his relationship with his girlfriend, Kathy, and his fear that Schmid might do something to her. Can you talk about his difficulties with Kathy over the course of these events? Yeah, so my father had a girlfriend named Kathy that was at one time Charles Schmid's girlfriend, but Charles Schmid had broken up with her and my father really liked her. And so he started dating her along the time that um, my father found out about the murders. Kathy had confided into my, to my father that something was happening at night. Somebody was coming around her home, messing with her screen, making noises. My father decided he was going to go to her house one night and try and see what was going on. He was near her house when he saw Schmid come down the road that night, park close to Kathy's home. But then he saw my father on the street and then ended up pulling up beside my dad and acting as if he was looking for my father. But at that point, my father really was convinced that Schmid had his sights on Kathy being his next victim. And So then the relationship with Kathy became very strained because my father really got obsessed with watching over Kathy to the point that it was over the top. And, you know, my father ended up day and night watching over this girl. And the family was, of course, convinced that my father was obsessed with their daughter and kept contacting the police. And so from the perspective of an outsider, clearly my father seemed to be obsessed with this girl. What wasn't clear to everyone else is the reason he was so obsessed with watching over her is he was convinced as soon as he turned his back or wasn't watching her that Schmid was going to have her as his next victim. Right. And that kind of looms over the story and part of what makes it so ominous. So, So I'd like to ask you next about Gretchen Fritz. Gretchen Fritz was the daughter of a renowned heart surgeon here in town And 
she was, you know, a beautiful teenage blonde girl and her and Schmid ended up dating and ended up uh, falling in love. Although it was a very tumultuous relationship, uh, they, they seemed to have a lot of passion between them. So it was constantly going between fighting and making up and fighting and making up. And so when my father talks about their relationship, you know, it was constantly an up and down. And, um, but he, you know, Schmidt did say he was in love with Gretchen and, and they seemed to have a real love hate relationship most of the time. But, um, he, that was his girlfriend. And then suddenly out of nowhere, Gretchen disappears and eventually discovered murdered along with her sister, Wendy. It didn't take long, right, for Schmid to tell your father about his involvement. Yeah, about a month after they disappear. So Gretchen and Wendy went one night to the drive-in to watch a movie, but then they never came home. And about a month after the killing, Schmid does confide in my father that he is the one that, that killed them. I mean, at that point, they didn't know if they were runaways or, you know, a lot of even the Aline Rowe, uh, the police really were chalking that up to runaway. There was a lot of runaways here in Tucson in the 60s. And so it was really quick to assume that these girls were running away. So when they first disappeared, the police were not sure if they were runaways or if something happened to them. But there was a lot of talk about uh, Schmid and things that happened at a party right before they were killed. And supposedly he got a phone call from Gretchen and said in front of a bunch of people, I'm going to kill her and, you know, left with another person. And but then they never came home. And so there was a lot of speculation. And um, he did confide in my father about a month later, which my father did have a feeling that's what happened to them. So so the motive for killing Gretchen is, is far different than than the one for Aileen Rowe. Can, yes. can you talk about the difference? Yeah. So at some point, Charles Schmid took Gretchen out to the gravesite of Aileen Rowe and confessed to her that he had done this, supposedly because he wanted to see if she would still love him, even when she found out that she had done this. Well, Gretchen, I guess, told him that she would always love him, but at the same time, she really started holding this over Schmidt's head and kind of blackmailing him with it and constantly threatening to go to the police anytime he didn't do anything she wanted. So she started really controlling Schmidt and using her knowledge of this killing as a way to control him. And so that's really when it became this hate relationship and eventually, you know, and nobody really knows exactly you know, what happened between them to make him finally decide he was going to kill her. But clearly it was because she knew too much and was threatening to go to the police. And so that killing was, and I think unfortunately her younger sister, Wendy just happened to be with her. And so her younger sister, Wendy ended up being killed as well. Uh, but that seems to be uh, more because she was threatening to go to the police uh, but clearly he clearly he had no problem killing two more young girls. One of the strangest twists in the story is when your father and Schmid suddenly find themselves being escorted to a meeting with a couple of local mob bosses. Can you explain how this meeting went down? It, it was kind of out of the blue, right? Yeah. So Joe Bonanno uh, was here in Tucson. Uh, Joe Bonanno is at that time was the head of the Bonanno crime family, which is one of the big five New York crime families. And so they lived here in Tucson and the father of Gretchen was the heart surgeon for Joe Bonanno. And so Gretchen's father had gotten Joe Bonanno involved in trying to find his daughters. And so one night, my father was invited to a party at Schmidt's home. Schmidt wasn't there. Um, everybody was waiting for Schmidt to show up. Eventually, Schmidt shows up with these two men that nobody knew. They were a little bit older than everyone else. And Schmidt asked my father to come outside. My father came out and he, he explained that these two men are from the mafia and they wanted to talk to my dad about Gretchen and Wendy. At that point, Schmidt had already confessed to my father about killing Gretchen and Wendy. 
So, of course, my father was freaking out about that, but they basically got loaded into a car and driven to an apartment complex here in town. And in that apartment was um, Bill Bonanno, which was uh, Joe Bonanno's oldest son, and then Joe Battaglia, which was one of the soldiers for Joe Bonanno. And they questioned Schmidt and my father for quite a while in that apartment about the girls. My father just kept insisting he didn't know anything. And, you know, it was obviously a very scary situation to be in. My father at that point knew he was lying to the mafia and was uh, really left him, you know, afterwards scared about what's going to go on from here. As they left that meeting, they did tell Charles Schmid that they would probably come looking for him because they wanted to take him. Schmid kept saying that he was sure the girls had gone to California and ran away to California. And so they told Schmid that they were going to come take him to California the next day to find the sisters. And so after that meeting, they got dropped off at a burger joint that they asked to get dropped off at. And at that point started really talking about what's going to happen. And my father just kept asking Schmidt, what are you going to do? Uh, because now the mafia was all involved in this. And at this point, my dad realized he had just gotten himself way deep in all of this and, and just didn't know what to do. And we don't want to make it sound as though your father is still casually attending Schmidt's parties. He, he wasn't going there for fun. He, he'd been spending a lot of his free time guarding Kathy's house yeah, And when he's invited to attend this party, he thinks that she'll be safe right. only because Schmidt will be hosting his own party and obviously not sitting outside of her house. Yeah. So at that time, and Schmidt had moved a little further away, um, they were kind of getting more distant. They didn't have as close a friendship as they did because my dad basically spent all of his time watching over Kathy's house, like literally day and night. And he was afraid to ever be away from either one of them. So Schmidt had called him one day and asked if he would come to the party. And my father reluctantly agreed, but decided, well, as long as he's at Schmidt's, he knows where Schmidt is. So as long as he was with one of the two of them, then he always knew Kathy was safe. And he admits looking back that he, you know, he really went kind of nuts. I mean, he really was so afraid that something was going to happen to her and felt like he was the one person that was going to prevent Schmid from from getting to her. But um, so, yeah, he he always just wanted to make sure he was with one of the two of them so that he never was out of the sight of them. Was he ever able to clear the air with Kathy later on or, or did they just end up going their separate ways? So they never spoke after all of this happened. Um, they never spoke again. They did run into each other a couple of times and kind of just looked at each other, but they, they never spoke. They never, um, so it, it just, it just ended. Um, but I think that for me, you know, in, you know, when you look at why he was so obsessed with Kathy, clearly to me, looking back at it, it had everything to do with Schmidt because you know, his obsession with Kathy ended. So, you know, clearly he was just trying to protect her, but he definitely went to extremes to do that. Right, right. So, so now he's in pretty deep. He, he's concerned for Kathy's safety, mixed up with the mob. And now suddenly yeah. Schmid approaches your father and tells him he wants to show him where Gretchen and Wendy's bodies are. And your father agrees to go with him. Well, so actually, my father is the one who brought it up. So right after the mafia situation and they got dropped off and my father was, you know, questioning, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? And Schmidt told my father that the thing that worried him the most is that he never buried the bodies. And my father was like, what do you mean you never bury the bodies? And he said that he just left them out laying out in the desert my father at that point decided, okay, he was in this really deep now. Here he just got questioned by the mafia. Charles Schmidt is telling him he killed these girls, but part of him still really didn't know that he believed that or not. And so he picked that time to kind of call his bluff and find out if he really had killed these girls and said, well, if you didn't bury the bodies, we need to go out there and bury them. And part of that was to even just find out, was this true? 
And at that point, Schmidt does take him out to the bodies and he finds out that they really were killed. And obviously that is the part that probably haunts my dad the most through his whole life. Just, you know, that that was a horrible thing to see and be involved in to see the bodies after they had been out there for that long a time. And I don't think he really knew what he was getting himself, you know, walking into. It's a really gruesome scene. Yeah. Schmidt and your dad stumbling around in the dark looking for bodies. Yeah. My mother has shared with me that, you know, my father had told her things about that afterwards, but I mean, it's just that that had to be, and, and that really haunted him for a really, really long time because, you know, it's just a horrible, a horrible thing to see and be involved in. And, and the bodies had been burned by the sun by this point. What wild animals had, had ravaged them? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not pleasant. Um, and it's, it's, you know, really, really sad when you read it because, you know, these were two beautiful young girls that whose lives were ended prematurely. And it's just, it's, it's really unpleasant. How, how again, did, did Schmid kill the sisters? They, they were strangled, right? Right. And when, uh, and then it's assumed to by the, the police and when they did the autopsy, cause there was never any sign of any Thing other than it could have been a strangling. And I, I believe he did tell my father that they were strangled. One of the sisters m- must have had to watch the other get murdered. That must have been absolutely terrifying. Yeah, I don't know how that unfolded and how he even managed that. But, but yeah, I mean, clearly either one of them had to know or watch the other. You know, I, I've never seen or read or heard anything of exactly how he managed to kill one sister while killing another, but somehow he managed to kill both sisters. So, so he never told your, your dad those details. Um, I don't think my dad had the actual details of how he did. And, and my dad may have some, you know, he's very even limited on what he wrote as far as the actual details of killing the two girls. And it's not something that he has shared with me exactly the, the specifics of how he killed them. Right. That that makes sense. Yeah. I'm sure that this has been an emotional roller coaster for him over over the years, mentally dealing with all of this. Yeah. So your dad basically at this point leaves town. He he's had enough of, of Tucson for a while. Well actually he was he was sent out of town. So he, finally Kathy's family had uh, gotten the police to take my father to court. And the courts actually uh, make my father move to Columbus, Ohio with his grandmother. And so he's not allowed to come back to Tucson. I want to say it's like three months, but for a certain amount of time, he's not allowed to come back to Tucson and he's forced to go to Ohio to be with his grandmother so that he no longer is near Kathy. And that's really when he feels 100% 100% helpless in in preventing anything from happening, which leads to him finally going to the police because now he can't protect her. But but it turns out to, to be a good thing for your father, right? It's a place where he can collect his thoughts, reconnect with family. Yeah, and I think, um, and it was just his grandmother. At that point, his grandfather had passed away, so it was just him and his grandmother. And he wasn't there for very long before he just, couldn't take it anymore and called the police because he just couldn't keep tabs on Kathy and make sure she was okay. I think, thank God this did happen because who knows how long this might have gone on. So, so it's a good thing that it did happen so that the truth came out and, and Schmidt was finally arrested. So next he goes to the police who are very receptive to him. They're open and eager to hear what he has to say. Yeah, so they, I mean, the only thing I think that they questioned him on is, you know, why you didn't come to us sooner. I mean, I think that was everyone's question. Why didn't you come, you know, forward sooner? But there was never any evidence against my father. I mean, clearly he was very forthright with everything once he uh, talked to the police. And it was clear that Schmid had done these murders. My father was able to tell them about John and Mary French's connection to the first murder. So he was really able to kind of shed light on everything and 
And at that point, they had everything they needed to arrest Schmid. Does your dad still harbor some guilt for not going to the police any sooner? Yeah, so I think, and again, I think this goes back to who you are at 20 years old. And I think that's why it's, I think that's what's so special about this book is you understand what he was going through at 20 years old and why he made those decisions. I think everyone can, from an outsider's view, look and go, oh, I would have gone to the police right away. Or, But the reality is, and it is true, he didn't, he didn't have a lot of specific details. The police had already questioned Schmid on both the Aline Rowe cases and the Gretchen and Wendy cases. Um, really, the first time my dad had any definite proof of anything was after they had been killed. Um, and I think at that point, he did feel the responsibility to keep him from killing again, which is why he was so adamant that he had to watch over Kathy, because in his mind, she might be his next victim. So I think he was trying to do what he thought he had to do to protect her but I think at a certain point, once he really knew the truth for sure, he also felt like he had gotten too far in and was afraid of of what could happen to him going to prison and stuff just for even going to the bodies with Charles Schmidt and trying to help bury them. And so once he saw the bodies and knew and tried to help Schmidt bury the bodies, which is why they went out there, I think he also had fears of spending the rest of his life in prison for that, just that little bit of involvement. He also had fears of all of Schmidt's friends that they, you know, my father, once this all came out, one of his fears was that Charles Schmidt's friends could come after him. And actually there is record of um, a bunch of the teenagers after the fact actually confessed to police that they were trying to come up with a plan to kill my father for what for turning in Schmidt. So Schmidt had this very strong following that, you know, my father really was afraid of what what could and would happen to him when this all came out. Hence the moniker, the Pied Piper of Tucson, right? Exactly. Yeah. So can you tell the story of your dad going out to the desert with the police? Yeah, so uh, the police came and got him from Ohio. He had called from Ohio, and they came the next morning and got him. And he took them out to the site uh, with the bodies, and they were able to find the bodies. And, you know, from that point, once they had the bodies, they were able to arrest Schmid. And the next day they had Schmidt arrested and um, and then my father was taken to the police headquarters and into the interrogation room with Schmidt, which to me is one of the times that I really felt for my father in reading this book, because you really feel of, you know, how uh, difficult that was to be face to face with him and Schmidt really tried to turn it around and say it was my father who was was the one that killed the girls and he was trying to frame him. And that actually ended up being the defense in the trial. The defense attorney did try to turn it on my dad and say, my dad's the one who actually killed the girls and he's trying to place the blame on Schmidt. And that was one of the things that really in the press at that time is there was a lot of speculation. And of course, you know, the media ran with that story um, a lot of the time because it, it was a sensational story to print. I, I do want to ask you about this very emotional confrontation that your dad is forced to have with Schmidt. He, he really didn't think he'd have to see him again. And then the police told him he had to go talk to him face to face. Can you elaborate on that story? So um, my dad does an amazing job of writing it. So I can't really relay it the way he did, but he he didn't want to go. Da- you know, uh, Schmidt was down in a lower level room uh, being interrogated and they did have Schmid listening to my father's recording, kind of confessing everything that Schmid had told him and everything that had happened. So he knew that Schmid knew that he was the one that went to the police, but he just talks of going into that room and how he just didn't want to go into that room. But Schmid just um, at that point was, such, you know, he looked so evil and such a mess. And, you know, when my father walked in, 
he just remembered, you know, Schmidt looking at him with, you know, a look that would just tear you apart and, you know, talking about sitting down in front of him and Schmidt really just trying to turn the tables on him and point the blame at him. And so it was it was a very difficult position for my dad to be face to face with him after Schmidt knew that he was the one that went to the police. Exactly. So the trial does not go in Schmidt's favor. He's sentenced. However, Arizona has already abolished the death penalty. So, so what happens to Schmidt after all of this? So he was sentenced to death for the two sisters, Gretchen and Wendy Fritz. That was the first trial. And then a year later, the second trial for Aline Rowe happened. And that one, he he tried to, he did not plead guilty at first on that one. So he never pleaded guilty. He never confessed to the Gretchen and Wendy Fritz uh, murders. But then uh, going into the Aline Rowe case, he never admitted to that murder either. He was trying to say that was all John Saunders who killed her. But um, F. Lee Bailey, who was a famed attorney um, coming off of the cases with Sam Shepard, who, if anyone's seen the movie The Fugitive, it's based on the Sam Shepard cases. But uh, F. Lee Bailey had just come off the Sam Shepard case. He was the defense attorney for uh, the Boston Strangler. And then later on, people would know F. Lee Bailey for the O.J. Simpson trial. So he's a very famous attorney, even back in the 60s, though. And so the defense hired him to help with the cases. But really early on, F. Lee Bailey came in and and really knew right away that Schmid was guilty and convinced him to plead guilty. And so then he pled guilty to the Aline Rowe case and got 50 years for that. Um, but later on, as you mentioned, the death penalty was abolished. And so um, his life, his death sentence was commuted to a life sentence. So at that point, he had a life sentence and then 50 years in prison. At some point after he initially pled guilty, he decided that he wanted to tell the police where the body was. Schmidt wanted to tell police where the body was because he wanted to prove that the that the prosecution's case was wrong and that Aline Rowe was not hit over the rocks, as they said, with rocks, as they said. So I guess he was trying to take his chances that if they unburied the body, that her skull would not be fractured. But he did take them out to the bodies and um but they did find that her skull was fractured and so therefore his sentence stood and so um at least they were able to find her body and and the body was recovered but um it certainly didn't help him in his case of saying that the killing didn't happen the way that they said what a narcissistic jerk yeah yeah i i think he was just hoping that maybe there wasn't really a fracture in her skull i don't i don't know what he was thinking but um but at least for the family they were able to recover the body but that um that would be probably a good three years after the murder had happened so where was schmid incarcerated so he was incarcerated in florence state prison he went to florence state prison but he was killed in prison so um, he was killed by two fellow inmates, uh, stabbed anywhere between 27 and 40 sometimes, depending on what resource you read. But um, it was a very brutal killing. He had an eye removed. Um, he, he was really, really just destroyed by them. Then died on, um, I believe it was March 30th, 1977, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, well, 75. It was during his incarceration that he plots various ways of escaping from prison. And he's actually successful at one point. D do you know much about that story? Yeah. So he had tried to escape previously and they found him hiding in a, a welding room in the, the prison. But eventually, because his his death sentence was commuted to life in prison, the interesting and sad fact about that is once he had the life sentence instead of the death sentence, he was treated pretty much like every other prisoner. And so he was actually able to do work off of. So, you know, when they have 
the prison inmates doing work outside of the prison grounds. Um, he was out doing work outside of the prison grounds and escaped with another triple murder, uh, Raymond Hudgens, and they escaped and ended up going to a nearby ranch in uh, near Florence and kidnapping uh, four people from the ranch. And eventually they released the, the people they had taken captive and they went their separate ways. Uh, they both were found. Schmidt was found in Tucson in a rail yard. At that time, they had actually had fear that Schmidt was coming after my father. And so they had put my family under police protection while they looked for Schmidt. And they did find him actually pretty close to the house that uh, my father last lived at the last time Schmidt would have known where my father lived. And it was right there at a Tucson rail yard that they found him. But then he was uh, he was taken back into custody. That, that's really, really scary. Is there evidence that that he was stewing away in prison? dreaming about getting revenge against your father? Um, well, I do know that at that time in Tucson, uh, one of the popular radio stations was KTKT, and they actually, after Schmid had been arrested and everything, they did an interview with Charles Schmid, and he actually did, you know, say on the radio, you know, this was you, how could you let, you know, he was, he was really kind of, he always claimed that this was my father, not him. And I do know that when he was he escaped, the first thing that the police thought was that he was coming after my father. And so that's why they put him under police protection. I don't know that he actually said that to anyone, but I think that definitely was a concern that um, he would, you know, want revenge over what my father had done turning him in. Wow. Do you remember being under police protection? No, I would have been two, so it's not really big in my memory. But okay. <laughs> um, but I guess it was, you know, you know, just a, a scary time of waiting to see what what was going to happen. Um, sure. Luckily, it was only a few days before they recaptured him. But you know, here in Tucson, I mean, with that happening, everybody was just it was a huge story of not knowing where he was and, and what we, he was doing. So thankfully they were able to capture him and, and it didn't last for too long. And, and for some reason, almost every account written about him has to include that he stopped and ate at a Sonic. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's good publicity for Sonic, but <laughs> I guess the first thing you want out of prison is a Sonic hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> They're everywhere in Tucson. <laughs> So I wanted to ask you about the reviews your father has gotten for the book yeah. from other true crime authors. They're pretty outstanding. Did you just mail out review copies of the book? Yeah. So basically, we just sent out review copies to really all of the true crime writers that we could get in contact with. And... um What's exciting is uh, we got a lot of great response. First of all, it's so exciting to see how supportive the writing community is and how willing they are to take the time to read someone else's book that they, you know, they don't know this person. But uh, the feedback was just amazing. You know, he ended up with um, around 25 testimonials from all kinds of uh, really well-known true crime writers. Two of them were New York Times bestselling uh, writers. Uh, we were able to have F. Lee Bailey, you know, read the book and gave his comments. And so we just um, really had, that was a fun process to send it out and wait for the feedback. And then to get such great feedback was exciting. And, and I think at that point, you know, even my dad was, I, I think he's always felt like, unsure that this is anything that somebody would want to read or how could it be a good book? He was 20 years old when he wrote it. But I think even though he hasn't read back through the book, I think that it was a confirmation to him that, um, you know, this is worth reading and that he did do a good job in writing this and that it is something that's that interests people. So I think it was exciting for him to get that feedback. And it will continue to be exciting as the months progress. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, I have to read a lot of books for this show, and a few of them are are these massive, voluminous texts that can very occasionally be a little dry. But the great thing about your book is that that it's a fast 
and engaging read. And, and many readers appreciate that. Yeah. One of his concerns is it's not it's not a really long book. And, you know, I think that was one of his concerns is, you know, it's not even that big. And, I, and I'm not one that myself likes to commit to anything really huge anyway. And I think um, I think most of us, we start books. And I mean, how many books do we start that are even if they're good books, we never end them because they just they're almost too long. And so I agree. This is one of those books that you can read, you know, really in a few hours, it keeps you engaged. And, and, you know, I think the way he wrote it really, I've read a lot of true crime books and, and the difference I feel is instead of being written from that outside perspective or the perspective of, of a detective or somebody who researched the stories, um, you really are reading it from, from what he's going through at that time. And it, and I, I think he's really did an amazing job of, of writing down his emotions and what he went through. And, and I think it keeps you engaged. So. Yeah, for sure. So where can people buy your book and get more information? Yeah. So there is um, a website for the book. I, dot Um, on there, it's got some more information about the, the cases, um, and, also, there's a trailer on the website, or you can go to YouTube. The the promotional trailer, iasquealer.com, is on there. And, and so that's been fun to have a trailer to kind of put out there so that people get a little feel for what the story is about. And the book is available everywhere. Books are sold. So you can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, pretty much anywhere that Somebody can order books, you know, the independent bookstores. It's it's available to anywhere, and it'll be available also in any ebook format. So um, if you just go to Amazon.com or to BarnesandNoble.com or through the website, you can get the book. One more question: How did you come to choose the title "I a Squealer"? Well, that that was the original title. So that was the title that he titled it when he wrote it in 1967. And I think that is how he felt at that time. You know, at that time, everybody, you know, he was the squealer and uh, all of the people surrounded uh, by Charles Schmidt or surrounding Charles Schmidt, you know, my dad was the squealer. And I think that was a word they maybe used more in the sixties than they use now, but um, that's, that was what he titled the book and we chose to keep that title. And I, I really like the title. Oh, I do too. It's definitely unique. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for letting me share the story and and being a part of this. Once again, I have been talking to Lisa Espich, the daughter of Richard Bruns, who authored the new book called I, a Squealer, the Insider's Account of the Pied Piper of Tucson Murders. Again, this is the most notorious podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world, I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.